This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins, that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us so we can get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the time, the privilege, all the things you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by getting a quick look at our outline. We are down here where it is bold, type, First missionary journey, we'll start that. We see Barnabas and Saul commissioned. We'll see Barnabas and Saul's mission in Cyprus. And then we'll begin number three, Paul and Barnabas in Basidian Antioch. I think we'll get that far today. So we start the first missionary journey of Paul. Well, let's begin. At the end of our last lesson, we saw the shift in narrative begin to take place. Though the ministry to the Jews continues primarily through the apostles at Jerusalem, Barnabas and Saul become the focus as they are ministering to the Gentiles in predominantly Gentile areas. Believers are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth in fulfillment of Christ's commission. Barnabas and Saul also picked up John Mark from Jerusalem, so he's with them. Thus we begin the background of the first missionary journey from 13.1 to 14.28. Now this missionary journey is about a 900 mile trip we will see Paul coming to the front of the mission team now his how his strategy of ministry is to first go to the synagogues and address the Jewish people and the God fearers the plan of outreach is more organized than what we've seen before we start with Barnabas and Saul being commissioned in verses 1 through 3. This amounts to the church recognizing them for what God wants them to do. In verse 1, we're introduced to five prophets and teachers in the church. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Let's talk about the word teachers for a moment. Actually, we don't see that word that many times. We do see people teach and that type of thing. This is actually the only use of this term in Acts. Doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of teaching. There certainly was. Didaskalos. Now let's talk about a teacher. A teacher was one who was more prepared and planned his approach to teaching than, well, someone like the prophets. They were more spontaneous. Whatever word they got from the Lord, they would pass it. The teacher had to go back and get what word they had from the apostles and the prophets, use the Old Testament since they didn't have the New Testament in written form, they would summarize doctrines and uh, even develop hymns of which help people learn. Notice hymns that help people learn, not a lot of the, I'm sorry to say, silly stuff that you hear today. They would take these uh, methods, use them as teaching, just as they would the rites, uh, still using baptism and the Lord's Supper. That was another teaching rite that taught Let's talk about Barnabas for a moment. He's mentioned here as we are familiar with him already. 
Now, he's a Levite from Cyprus who resided in Jerusalem and became a leading figure in the Jerusalem church. He would also have the latest information from Jerusalem, bringing it over to other peoples outside of Jerusalem, truth to be passed on. Simeon here, who's called Niger, may well have been from North Africa, since the Latin loan word Niger refers to someone who is black or of dark complexion. We have Lucius of Cyrene. Now this refers to a native city in the city of, a native rather, from the city of Cyrene on the coast of northern Africa, west of Egypt. Now this is all we know about Simeon and Lucius. Now, Manaean, it's noted, let's look at the verse again, a lifelong friend of Herod. Now, this word lifelong friend has a couple of meanings. Um, it means someone who was basically raised with someone, and that's why you'll see something like a foster brother in the translations, or at least the idea. But as well as a lifelong friend, you expect a foster brother might very well be a, a friend from childhood. And that's what it meant. That's what this amounts to. And he was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Let's talk about Herod. This is Herod Antipas, not Herod Agrippa. Herod Antipas governed the area of Galilee from 4 B.C. to A.D. 39. He's the one that had John the Baptist beheaded. He's called a tetrarch. Now, a tetrarch was a ruler with a rank and authority lower than a king. Uh, he ruled only with the approval of the Roman authorities. He's roughly equivalent to being a governor of a region. But in the New Testament, this Herod as tetrarch of Galilee is sometimes called a king. So he basically operated as a king in that area. He had that kind of authority. And the last person mentioned in our verse, let me show it one more time, is Saul. Saul. So what we see here are these prophets and teachers in Antioch. It's a pretty loaded church when it comes to qualified people and doctrinal teachers. Well, verse 2 tells us that they were in the mode of worship and fasting, um, which was also accompanied with prayer. Verse 2. While they were serving the Lord, that's the same word as worshiping, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, when we talk about serving here, as I said, it's also worshiping. So they're worshiping, uh, using their gifts, uh, serving the Lord there in the church, which involved fasting, as mentioned here. They get a word from the Spirit. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly how this happened, but normally it would go through a prophet or an apostle, probably a prophet, where they get a word from the Lord, a revelation from the Lord, and they reveal it to the congregation, and of course it's attributed to the Holy Spirit. The, the word is set aside, excuse me, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So here we have the Lord speaking through the Spirit. The work is not specified yet, but what we see follow indicates that it had to do with the mission to the Gentiles. So this ends up being set apart for a different service of sorts, no longer there just at Antioch. This verse tells us that while the church was in the mode of worship and service and fasting, that the Spirit spoke to them and directed them to set apart Barnabas and Saul. So that summarizes the verse. Let's talk about Barnabas and Saul as a team now. 
Uh, they're both veterans in ministry at this point, a few years under their belt, both having spent some time in Antioch. Uh, they would have shown themselves to be proven and capable of a more challenging and wider service. And it is, it is these two the Lord directs to be commissioned for a more broadened ministry. Verse 3. Then after they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them off. <clears throat> they is not specified here. Uh, we do see the uh, more fasting and praying going on. It's probably the church leadership that did the laying on of hands in this commission for service. And then the church as a whole sends them on their way. Though this Holy Spirit directed the course of action, the entire church is involved in sending these men out to reach the Gentile communities. Listen, the people knew that's why they were there. They knew they were there to get the word of the Lord out, and these men would get it out. In the meantime, some would stay back home doing their mission, serving the people, uh, utilizing their gifts in their own particular area. Barnabas and Saul had already been taking on the role of missionaries and apostles. Uh, remember, the apostle means basically someone sent by others in their stead. They represent them. The twelve represented Jesus, uh, as did Paul. Now the direction of ministry would change for these two men to something more specific. Now there's a lesson here it's an obvious lesson and when God's people are gathered together worshiping praying is at this time the Lord is often he will reveal the will to his people those who are more knowledgeable in a local church today will perhaps suggest that the church start start doing this or that uh, people uh, in tune with the Lord in tune with what the church is to be doing will uh, out of tendency to support. Often in a church where they're not directed that way by the Spirit, there's conflict. But when they are together in the Spirit, in tune with the Lord, you might say, they will agree on what needs to be done. It just makes good sense. And what they do is answer the question of how can we be more effective for Christ? Their action with the direction from the Spirit is to send and support two of their strongest ministers out into other communities to spread the gospel. Something that churches should be doing around the world if they're solid with the Lord. Well, so Barnabas and Saul's mission begins now and Cyprus. This will carry us. This is point two. Chapter 13, 4 through 12. Now let me just pause for a moment before we get into this section. I want us to understand something about studying this type of uh, teaching. What I mean by that, going through a book like Acts, uh, basically historical narrative, but you get a lot of comment, a lot of interesting uh, situations going on as we see these doctrines develop and the church develop and the church to grow. You might be thinking, you know, I'm really not getting much out of this. Well, you have to ask yourself, what are you expecting? If you're expecting a thrill every few minutes, well, you're in the wrong ministry. I teach the Word. And when God gives us a book like the book of Acts, there is a definite purpose. It contributes to our growth in a number of ways. Some you might not understand, some you might not quite see at first, but first of all, you're getting a tremendous amount of background for what's going on in God's work. You can observe through what these people do sometimes what would work for you. For instance, as you make a decision as a group, whether it be as a church or a family or, or a small group of believers, what do you all think you should be doing? So you learn little lessons like that. At the same time, you're building up an understanding of how the Spirit works, how God works with people in different ways. We're going to see that just in the way Paul uh, uh, evangelizes different people in different situations. So we learn those lessons. But in order to learn that, you have to be in tune. 
And by that I mean, of course, control with the Spirit, but be sensitive to what's being said. Understand what's going on. And then it may not be long, you'll say, oh yeah, that was like what happened back then. We'll see that in some of your illustrations. This has happened before, but a little different twist on it this way. And folks, this is how we make application. We pick up on these different twists and see there's different applications for us in different situations. This is a video ministry. This is not going to be exactly parallel for what we're seeing here, but this is an outreach. We do have our support from people like, well, many of you who are listening. Through your prayers and support, this ministry grows into other areas, and it has a worldwide outreach. That's obvious. I get letters from many different nations around the world from people who, uh, if some are even supporting this ministry financially. It's wonderful to see people from all over the world participate in this ministry and support it. You might not be aware of this, but Paul wrote many of his epistles while on his journeys. Uh, while he was stopped in different places, he'd write back or maybe anticipate where he's going, and that's where we get uh, many of his written epistles, so this background is invaluable. Well, let's look at this first missionary journey. I'm going to get a map up here. This is a well-known map, very simple, uh, easy to look at um, and, and follow. Let me just read verse 4 to you. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So go over to the right part of your map. You see them in Antioch. They're going to go down to Seleucia. Now this is a port city. Now, Barnabas and Paul are going to go down to this port city. They're with uh, uh, John Mark. It's, a, uh, it's still in Syria. It's about 16 miles from Antioch, and it's north of a river that goes through here. You can maybe see the river on here. You can see the Orontas. I think that's okay. It's right about that area. It's it's right in this area, and this is just uh, the mouth of the river is right down in here. So we're close to the mouth of the river. So it's a a uh, like I said a port city. 16 miles from Antioch, 4 or 5 miles northeast of the mouth of the Orontos River that connects with the Mediterranean. And they're going to sail over to Cyprus, the well-known island of Cyprus. It's of great importance. Uh, it was a, in early times, it was an important island. It was situated the shipping lanes between Syria, Asia Minor, and Greece. You can see it's a, a great stopping place, especially if you've got a storm coming and you need resupply or something. It's the third largest island in the Mediterranean. It's about 140 miles long and 60 miles wide. Now remember that Barnabas was from Cyprus. Maybe he still has connections there. We expect he would. And that uh, might be helpful as they go through the island. But he has a couple new faces with him this time. All right, so let's go back to our verse. Let me show you the verse I just read. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God, in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John Mark as their assistant. We're going to be going back and forth their map here. So they arrive at the city of Salamis on the island of Cyprus. This is about 130 miles sail to Salamis from Seleucia. Now Salamis a city on the southeastern coast of the island of Cyprus. This is a, a commercial center and a center of Judaism. 
It was the most important city of the island and the administrative center for its eastern half. Now, the provincial capital was 90 miles southwest at Paphos. You can see that on the map as well. The population of Cyprus was mostly Greek but had a sizable Jewish population. Barnabas and Saul started their mission in the synagogues of the city. This is part of the pattern we see. And remember, John Mark is with them. So that basically tells us uh, what verse 5 is trying to uh, tell us. Verse 6, we come to a new setting and a missionary challenge. They go through the whole island as far as Paphos. We just saw that. They come upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. <clears throat> now, they don't mention any evangelistic activity. They just basically looks like they stop at Salamis, maybe pick up some supply, and move on to Paphos. Now, actually, this town is probably New Paphos. The older Paphos is some 10 miles away, but was destroyed by an earthquake in 15 BC. Then they built the new Paphos. New Paphos was on the southwestern coast of the island of Cyprus, not far away from the old one. It is where they worshiped in the cult of the Syrian goddess Paphilia. I should say Paphia. P-A-P-H-I-A. She's equivalent to Aphrodite. If you know Aphrodite, she's the goddess of sex and fertility and that type of thing. But it's just one of many cults that were there. Remember, so many of these cities had uh, temples and places to worship their idol cults. It was the provincial uh, place of the where the uh, provincial council, <clears throat> uh, it was the seat of the provincial council, the Roman proconsul. It was a capital city. So it was the uh, capital city, you might say, of the area. There they came upon a certain magician. He's also described as a false prophet. So there is demon activity going on with this man. He shows power. His name is Bar Jesus. Now, Bar, of course, means son in Aramaic, so he's son of Jesus, or uh, Jesus also was uh, Joshua. Um, we'll see more of him in verse 8. Now, it's revealing that the first major outreach from Jerusalem ran into, remember, Simon the sorcerer in Samaria, 8, 9 through 24. So now the first major outreach from Antioch runs into another of the type, a magician, a false prophet. Now you think of magician, don't think in terms of someone who's pulling rabbits out of a hat or doing card tricks. This is a man who basically, the, the word means power. He had power. And when you think of magician in the Bible, think of someone who has a power, a demonic power. Almost every time is behind this. So they have some sort of, it's just not tricks. Now they use trickery too. But many were demon-possessed, or had demonic powers or influence with them. There would be demon activity around them, let's put it that way. So those who got involved would get caught up in the demonic thinking and the demonic influence and that type of thing. This become very powerful during the tribulation when the Antichrist is spreading his influence as the Holy Spirit is uh, withdrawn and the, the evil, you think we have evil now, when he comes, it'll be so prevalent, it'll seem almost the way to go. And what I mean by that is, it'll be the acceptable way to go. And that's why Christians, the one reason Christians won't fit in. And we see that unbelievable influence right now in the United States in many ways where evil comes in, especially in the area of politics. Things are so evil right now in politics. It's just uh, it's incredibly revealing if you get to watch some of this uh, stuff that we see sometimes on the news. Well, 
This man is also called a false prophet, so he communicated false prophecies, claiming to have truth. It was a lie. So what Luke is showing us here is what was typical of ministry in those days. They faced opposition from the demonic world, just as they faced opposition to the Jews and sometimes the government. Now, we as Christians always face various types of opposition if we're saying anything, if we're doing anything, if we're serving. If we reach out to people, we will have opposition in a variety of ways. That's normal. That's to be expected. If you're not getting any opposition, you better check yourself to see if you're really standing on solid ground when it comes to truth. Verse 7 continues to give us the background and setting. He was the pro council. He was with the pro council. Now we're talking about Bar Jesus. He was with the pro council, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now the proconsul, he's the Roman official who ruled over a province, traditionally under the control of the Roman Senate. They wouldn't have troops present. In contrast, Judea was an imperial province, province where they did have troops present. In fact, they were required. It says here about this Sergius Paulus, he's a man of intelligence. The word for intelligence, look at that for a moment. This man would be, well, I'd say he's no dummy. Sunetos. He's able to understand with this sermon and watch. You're not going to pull the wool over his eyes easily. All right? He has discernment. He has wisdom. He can pick up on things. In other words, he's very perceptive. Now, let's not misunderstand what's going on here. He's the pro-counsel. He wants to hear what Barnabas and Saul have been proclaiming. What are they saying that's got these people's attention? Why is Bar-Jesus so disturbed by them? Is there something they can be charged with? So the verse tells us, and this is, can be a little misleading if you don't read it right, he sought to hear the word of the Lord. So he wants to hear this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it this thing, in his term you might say, this word of the Lord. What are these people saying from God, you see? It's not necessarily that he's super hungry for truth, though one might perceive it that way. But inside, that happens to be the truth. He wants to hear what these men have to say. What was this word of God they had to say? So this presents Barnabas and Saul an opportunity to present the gospel to this island ruler. But there at his side is opposition. In verse 8, we come back to that opposition. We get his name. But Elamas the magician, this is basically what they called him. All right. Uh, we'll talk about the name for a moment. Notice in parentheses, for that is the meaning of his name. He opposed them, seeking to turn the pro council away from the faith. So he finds out it all comes down to hearing this word from God and the pro council starting to respond. Oh, yeah? Is that right? Huh, that's interesting. That makes sense. And old uh, uh, Elamas over there is probably going, uh oh. He's, he's starting to buy it. Okay. Now, what is this phrase? For Elamas the magician, for that is the meaning of his name. Now, there's some debate on this, but Elamon means wise in the Arabic. But more likely, this is from the Aramaic, not the Arabic, but the Aramaic meaning powerful. This is what a magician is, someone with power, a sorcerer, a fortune teller. He tells the future. They were involved in demonic activity, perhaps working as a team with other demons, finding out and manipulating the future. So it appears that he can really tell the future. They were involved in healing, looking for signs through formulas, incanta incantations, amulets, and other forms that 
allegedly gave them discernment. So how would a demon heal somebody? Well, you have one demon possess him. You have another demon possess the person who's going to heal him. He comes up and he tells the man to be healed. The demon hears it. He says, it's time for me to get out. So he does, and suddenly the man's healed. Wow, what power, you see? Now that is trickery. What about sorcery and magic in Judaism? Well, there were those who still practice it among the Jews, claiming powers to do things, uh, like cast out demons. We saw that back in Luke 11:19. It's demon activity, appearing to work in the guise of doing God's work with Judaism, within Judaism. We see the same thing today, where we see this type of demonic activity uh, in uh, certain religions. You even have some in Protestantism who, uh, charismatics and similar types, they get caught up in demon acti activity, not knowing they're playing right into the hands of Satan. They have no business getting involved in that. We're never told to do anything like that. In fact, we're told to stay away from it. Well, back to our story. It was not unusual for someone like Elamos to accompany a proconsul. After all, he had powers. The proconsul might have wanted him beside him for different reasons if he could, for reasons if he could tell the future why you'd want someone there to help you what decision shall I make in this and that how's this going to turn out those type of things but as a magician as a power man he opposed Barnabas and Saul he was there to make sure the pro council did did not get involved with these men accept them but to keep them away from the faith but he can't afford to be exposed for what he is that is Elamos he can't afford to have himself uh, revealed to what he really is, which Saul will do. In verse 9, Saul will come in and deal with this magician. Now remember, Saul's also a member of the Roman world. That was his background. He was a citizen. He had lived among the Romans. He had privileges that uh, other people who lived among the Romans did not. So he's going to come forward like we haven't seen him yet. He's going to put this Elamos in his place. Verse 9. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at him. At this point, we see that Saul, who is also called Paul, takes the lead on the missionary team. Now let's talk about the name Paul for a moment, because here we kind of have a flip where uh, he'll be called Paul from almost completely from now on. Uh, Paul is what we call his cognomen, C-O-G-N-O-M-E-N. It's kind of like a nickname. Uh, and Paul is Greek. He will use his Greek name in the Gentile world. This makes good sense. Uh, from this point on, in fact, Luke will refer to him as Paul. With only a couple exceptions. It's the word is uh, the name Paul is from Paulos meaning little. Now, so here's what's going on. As Paul is presenting the gospel, this Elamos is trying to divert the message, trying to counter what Paul is saying. Paul turns on this sorcerer. He faces him, stares right at him. He's going to tell this man what he really is, and then pronounce a curse on him. Verse ten. Well. What is he? Verse 10, he said and said, Paul speaking, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and wrongdoing, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now these are all strong accusations. You son of the devil, you serve the devil. You're like the devil. All right? You enemy of all righteousness, of anything done right, of everything that's right, you don't want it. Then he says you're full of deceit, all right, and wrongdoing. Now, this word is kind of soft from what I could, what it really kind of means here in this context, but uh, I noticed one of the translations has villainy. I thought, does people, anybody know what villainy means? They probably do, they think of villains. So here's the word for wrongdoing. Uh, 
Rari Ur Gia, to gain some personal end through clever or trickery means. Then the third accusation, let's go back to our verse. Last phrase, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? He misleads people with his powers. He gets people off the right path to God. Well, he's to stop that. And he will, for now, at least, for a while, because he's going to become blind. Verse 11, we see the curse. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you'll be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Well, this is something else, the way this is put together here. Let's break it down a little bit. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. This is a way of saying the power of God is going to come upon you. In fact, it's coming on right now. God's power is going to come over you. And you'll be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. In other words, he's going to be temporarily blinded. He'll be in the dark as Paul does his work. Now what's interesting here is this is a curse on an unbeliever. Now, remember Ananias and Sapphira? How can you forget? Now they were believers, but they were severely disciplined for their gross deceit, and they were put to death uh, immediately. Remember Zechariah, John the Baptist's father? He experienced temporary blindness, but that was to learn a lesson, that is, not to question God, as well as a sign that God was at work in their situation. So this is different. He's putting a curse on an unbeliever. Temporary bl temporarily blinding this guy. This is probably, uh, my estimation, to set this guy aside, make him ineffective right now while Paul is witnessing. So what happens? Second half of the sentence, immediately mist and darkness fall upon him. Mist is actually a technical term for describing someone blind. Today we might say that, well, we can't, we don't have any light. We, it was completely dark. Back then that says a mist. All I have is a mist here. Probably considered a very thick mist. So now that he's blind, what does he do? He went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. He needs help. Who else had to go through something like this? Paul. Surely Paul thought of himself as his own blindness. Um, as it came upon him, he needed help too to get around. He had to be led by someone else. However, Paul responded in faith. This man has an opportunity to respond, just as the proconsul will, but he does not. What does the proconsul do? Verse 12. Then the proconsul believed. And when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Let me read that again. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Let's start with the first phrase. Then the proconsul believed. What is the level of the proconsul's belief? Well, there's nothing negative here. Now, there's no mention of him being baptized, but there may be other reasons for that. But I think we should assume it is genuine and that he became a Christian right there and then. Now, there's other reasons. One is the context. He's in contrast to this Jewish magician who's hardened and against the truth. It would also show how Paul's ministry is a success. We also see that Paul is getting a response from another Gentile and that this will multiply. And add to that, this man is a high rank. He's an upper class Gentile. So what Luke shows us here is that Paul's direct approach to the Gentiles is working. Cornelius' conversion had been within the realm of the Jerusalem church, but this is different. This is Paul well into Gentile territory and evangelizing a provincial ruler. So this is a new approach, 
and a major step in Paul's Gentiles ministry. And the implications are huge. The Gentile world is opening up like we've not seen it open before. Even those at the top of society are trusting in Christ. And Paul will now lead the way to the Gentiles. So in this short account, we see Paul use two different approaches in taking the truth to people. To the strong opposition of Elamas, its confrontation and shutting him down. To the more open Sergius, it is presenting the gospel to an open heart. So there's some lessons to be learned here. Depending on the response of people guides us in how to approach them with the gospel. We come to our third point here in our outline. Paul and Barnabas in Pisidian Antioch. 13 through 50 is a long section. We won't get it all done today. Now let me just give you an outline of the next several verses. We'll, like I said, we won't, get through all, we won't get through all of this today. We'll get to the setting. 16 through 25, Paul presents a survey of Israel's history up to the time of John. We may get through that. Then he gets into the declarations about Jesus, some application and a follow-up speech on the next Sabbath. And then we see some reaction to the speeches. So let's continue with the setting, and then Paul will begin his speech with a survey of Israel's history. Now, when we come to this first of three major speeches by Paul in the book of Acts, the purpose of this speech is to show how Jesus fulfilled the promises to David. Now the Jews are well-rounded and grounded, in David. After all, he's the one that got the covenant of promise. The Psalms also spoke of the coming Messiah. David's life is a testimony of what God can do and will do with someone who loves him. Well, let's look at the setting, verses 13 through 15. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. All right, let's pull up our map. Here we are again, first missionary journey. They leave Paphos down here on Cyprus sell up to Perga. Now this is an area, as you can see, called Pamphylia. At this point, John leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. Let's talk about Perga. A city in Pamphylia about 12 miles inland from the southern coast of Asia Minor. The journey from Paphos to Perga is about 112 miles. There's a sail up there. Now, this is a major city. Uh, the major deity, uh, I should, no, I'm going to take that back. It's not a major city, but it, its major deity was Artemis, to use the Greek name. At that point, John Mark left them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, I say John Mark just to make sure you understand it's not the Apostle John, it's John Mark. We don't know why he left, but later becomes an issue between Paul and Barnabas. Well, the team moves on to Antioch and Pisidia. Now, notice it goes up north to Antioch and Pisidia. Let's go back to our verses. Verse 14. But they went on from Perga and came up to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue and sat down. So the missionary team comes to this Antioch in Pisidia. Now you may know why I often said the other Antioch is not Antioch in Pisidia. Uh, the Romans had a tendency to name many towns by their rulers. Uh, so you'll have uh, duplicate names and the towns are often not far apart. That's why you have to identify them by the region. 
And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Now, this is Paul's pattern. The city of Pisidia is about 100 miles north of Perga. It's a Roman colony and the seat of military and civil authority in southern Galatia. One had to trek over the Taurus Mountains to get there since the city was 3,600 feet uh, above sea level. Now, this Antioch was the most important city of southern Galatia and included within its population a rich amalgam of Greek, Roman, Oriental, and Phrygian traditions. Acts also indicates that it had a sizable Jewish population. Next sentence. And on the Sabbath day, they went in to the synagogue. Well, the synagogue were, is where Paul liked to go. That was what he often did. He administered to the Jews and whatever Gentiles were present. This is his routine pattern when he enters a city that has a sizable Jewish population. The one he didn't do this on is Athens. We'll see that later. Well, when he was refused in the synagogue, he would turn directly to the Jews. But this time he's going to get to talk. Now later, here's some doctrine for you. In his epistle to the Romans, Paul will write, there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles, either in condemnation, that's Romans 2, 1 through 3, 20, or access to God, Romans 3, 21 through 31. So his ministry at Pisidian Antioch began to express this equality. Everyone's condemned, everyone needs saved, everyone can have the word if they want it. Now the synagogues weren't the only place Paul went. At times he'd go to the Gentiles outside the synagogue, but his gospel was open to all. It was the same gospel, but sometimes the strategy has changed. Now, if you recall, the Old Testament pattern was to the Jew first, the nation Israel, and by design, they were to, supposed to, carry, it to uh, carry the message to other people. They were supposed to tell about God to other peoples of surrounding nations. The New Testament pattern was similar in the early years, but now with Peter, breaking the mold of Gentile ministry to Cornelius, and now Paul opening up uh, the mold more, we might say, broadens it to go directly to the Gentiles. In addition, it is through Paul that much of the new covenant revelation will flow. He will speak of the mystery made known to him which was not made to other generations. That mystery centered on the incorporation of the Gentiles into the New Covenant Church. Jew and Gentile together in one body, sharing the promise in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 3, 2 through 6. Well, back to our passage. So Barnabas and Paul go into the synagogue and sit down. Let me give you some background of a typical synagogue service. We haven't looked at this for a while, but typically the first century synagogue service would have included, they go through their routine, they go through their rituals, they have the Shema, that's the prayer, the Shemoah Esra, the liturgy of the 18 benedictions that have blessings or prayers at the time, a reading from the law, a reading from one of the prophets, a priestly blessing, and then an exposition. There was usually one leader of the synagogue usually an elder who was in charge of the building and making arrangements for the services, arrangements for the services. Sometimes there were two leaders, perhaps it was carried on, uh, someone held the office for life, but it was passed on within the family. That was often the case, that passed on the leadership of the synagogue within the family. Verse 15, we pick up in the routine here of what they did. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. Um, literally in the Greek it says, men, brothers. Now that's a little awkward, but that's what they said, men, brothers. These leaders asked the visiting missionaries if they wanted to give a word of encouragement. Paul takes him up on the opportunity. 
Now this becomes his first sermon, the first of three in the book of Acts. In other words, in chapter 14, and the third is in chapter 17. Each one is basically a summary of what Paul said. This one begins with a survey of Israel's history. Sound familiar? Remember Stephen? This history goes up to the time of John. That's John the Baptist. Well, let's get started on it. Speech begins in verse 16. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now we don't have any mention of what scripture had just been read, but Paul's going to give a word of encouragement, bring him into something they need to hear right now. He begins by motioning with his hand. That was a way of saying, uh, listen up. He calls them the men of Israel. That would be first the Jews present. Then he says, and you who fear God. Now that would be the Gentiles present. We've talked about this before, but Gentiles would worship the God of Israel. In many cases, they would attempt to keep the Mosaic law, but they didn't take on circumcision, making them an official proselyte. But I would say these people were the types who wanted to know something about God that didn't, but didn't want to get caught up in the Jewish religion. So this is where they would go. This is where they heard the scripture. In verse 17, Paul will emphasize the pattern of God's redemptive activity from Abraham to David. That's what his uh, first part of his sermon is about. The speech is similar, as I said, to Stephen's, except the emphasis here. The emphasis here is God's redemptive activity from Abraham to David. That's what we see here. Verse 17. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted arm he led them out of it. Oh, there's three big points here. First of all, the God of this people Israel. God is the God of the people of Israel. Special relationship between God and Israel. Next thing, chose our fathers, our, notice Paul identifies with his audience of Jews. Now, God chose the forefathers of Israel for himself. This is a special covenant relationship between God and Israel that God initiated. The next phrase, and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. They became great in numbers as well as they began to gain power. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. This indicates God was involved. His power, it's a metaphor for power, uplifted arm. So this is redemption, the people from Egypt. This is the point of redemption. This becomes the basis, as you may remember, for the Mosaic Covenant. So he redeemed them from Israel. God specially redeemed Israel from the slavery of Egypt. And they had great potential. They had already grown in numbers. And now, if you remember the story, they were a threat to Egypt. So they're becoming a powerful people. Verse 18 reveals more of this relationship. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. Now, this is not really a compliment, is it? Put up with them. Let's look at the word. Um, Trapa foreo. To bear. To bear one's manners. Endure one's characters. Not should be one's, not ours. Okay. The old, only oh, uh, New Testament use. Only time it's used in the New Testament. And it really does. They're putting up with their ways, their manners, that type of thing. God tolerated their 40 years of rebellion, disobedience. He did up to a point. He was faithful despite their lack of faith. 
Paul goes to the next section of history, verse 19 through 21. He reviews the conquest, the period of the judges, and requests for a king. So he moves pretty fast here in reviewing the history. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. Seven nations are mentioned in Deuteronomy 7, 1. Always fun reading them. Here we go. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger than stronger than you and stronger than you. Notice that, larger and stronger than you. And the verse said, let's look at it again. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as inheritance. Basically, the influence and power of these nations were wiped out. Jebusites is how they got Jerusalem. Well, all this took about 100, excuse me, verse 20. Let's just go to verse 20. I'm kind of reading ahead here. All this took about 450 years, and after that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. So there's the whole judges period right there in one phrase. Now what's the 450 years include? Time in Egypt, time in the wilderness, and the conquest of the land. Now this is a rounded off number. Verse 21, what happened next? Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. Now this is a traditional number uh, for his reign. Sometimes they become, um, well, I almost call it folklore, but basically what people understood, what, what went into the stories, not always 100% accurate. But then we understand that when we read it as a traditional figure. In verse 22, we come to David. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. First phrase, and when he had removed him, when he had removed Saul, I found in David. Now this is quoted from Psalm 89.20. The son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Now that's a quotation from Samuel 13, 14. So uh, Paul is, recall, uh, is recalling some of the very words used in Scripture about this situation. The part of the summaries here that we've seen so far, we're coming to the climax of what we've seen in this summary. When it talks about David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart. Notice, who will do all my will. So what we've seen is kind of like, a, to me, it's kind of like you, you picture a funnel. The tip of the funnel down at the bottom points to David. You're bringing the history down to David. Paul describes Israel's history carefully pointing out some of the main things up to David and from here in verse 23 he jumps forward to Jesus verse 23 of this man's offspring God has brought to Israel a savior Jesus as he promised there's that word offspring the word sperma the seed all right, study the seed many times in different ways. This is what I call the seed factor. Part of the Davidic promise, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Part of that promise from God is that he would have a seed that would become the Messiah. That seed, back to our verse, God has brought to Israel a Savior. Jesus as he promised. Paul identifies Jesus as the seed, as the Savior. Now, a Savior is also 
uh, one who fulfills the role of a deliverer. Jesus is that deliverer. He's that savior. So, for the Jew of Old Testament times, it's looking forward to the promised seed who came as Jesus. Now, while Paul speaks, it's for both Jew and Gentile who looks back at that promised seed fulfilled in Jesus. He is that promised offering that came in the person of Jesus. He is the son, the son of David, and the son of God. verse 24, Paul speaks of John the Baptist and his ministry before Jesus came. So he backs up a little bit and talks about John. Before his coming, John had promised a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And this is an important part of Israel's history. They were called to repentance before the Messiah came on the scene. John's preaching a baptism of repentance prepared the way for the public ministry of Jesus. John was the one before the coming one. And his target audience was all the people of Israel. Notice that at the end of the verse. So John the Baptist becomes the last link in Israel's history before the coming of the Messiah. In the verse 25 we close out. But while John was completing his mission, he said repeatedly, What do you think I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So in these few words, he sums up the comparison of who he is as John to this coming one. Notice the word mission, but while John was completing his mission, the word is dramas. It's a course, a course of life, or mission as translated. But while John was completing his mission, he said repeatedly, making the point, what do you think I am? I'm not he. I'm not he. That's not who I am. That's part of his message. He repeated it again and again, making the point. Someone far greater than him is coming. And then he qualifies it. I can't even tie his sandals. I don't even qualify. And that was the most menial menial task of a slave. It's interesting because one of the times he said this back in Luke 3.16, the verse is completed with John mentioning that the coming one will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And of course that ushers in the new era of the kingdom of God for the new covenant church. Well, we'll continue here next time. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, this has been another challenging lesson with many parts to it, uh, many major as well as uh, minor lessons, we might say. Challenges of what we've heard today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.